الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته and welcome to a another installment in our weekly series the morning meeting i'm sorry the monday meeting not morning sorry monday uh, yeah 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 it's, i just took, just started so before we actually uh, get underway, there was one. Uh, before we actually get underway, there was one uh, housekeeping item that I wanted to uh, put out there, and that is that um, I have a celebratory meal that I'm supposed to uh, host for three Muslim ladies in a correctional facility in Greenwood, South Carolina. Uh, had that that was supposed to be catered, and now it looks like the catering has fallen through. And I'm wondering if there is uh, someone who would be willing to cook a meal for three ladies, consisting of um, protein, rice, uh, maybe vegetable, bread, and a dessert, something along those lines. It's for three people. And I would need that uh, for Thursday morning, maybe about 10 o'clock, so that I could transport it out there uh, by 11 or 12. If there's someone who's willing uh, to do that, uh, please let me know. You can let me know directly or you can let me know through my family. Uh, otherwise, we'll just have to figure out something else. But uh, I did say uh, I would try to get support from the community because, as I said, the caterer kind of fell through. Again, we we're looking for someone will be willing to make a meal for three ladies uh, on Thursday. It would have to be done by about 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. Thank you. Um, so uh, today we were expecting to begin or to resume our commentary on Kitab At-Tawheed. Uh, but unfortunately there was uh, something that uh, occurred last week that requires me to delay that for one more week. So last week a uh, question was posed in the context of our discussion, Hussam, would you mind to finish that outside and th then join the group? Really? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So last week there was a question posed in the context of our discussion on the rulings and regulations of fasting of the six days of Shawwal. And that question was, can you fast on Friday? And I proceeded to respond uh, to the question in the course of responding. A few things happened. One, I conflated two similar but separate issues. Number two, I misquoted, misreferenced, and erroneously applied a hadith. And number three, I provided an answer I provided an answer that was misleading at best. So I would like to take this time uh, that we would have uh, used to resume our discussion of Kitab at take this time to correct and clarify some of the misunderstandings and er erroneous uh, uh, messaging that occurred last week. So the two issues that got conflated were the ruling of fasting on Friday and the ruling of fasting on Saturday. Two separate issues, but they got conflated uh, in my head as I was answering the question. And as I was answering, it was almost like there was something in the back of my mind. It's almost like the feeling you get when you leave the house and you think you've left an appliance on. Like, you left the, did I leave the iron on? Did I leave the stove on? And you keep going back and forth. Wali comes off the to I didn't. Maybe I did, and so there was just something there, and because I couldn't put my finger on it, I kind of just tried to dismiss it, but it just remained there. It remained there even when I went home, and then ultimately, um, it became clear uh, that, yeah, this, conf this conflation of, or conflating of two different issues had occurred and led to um, a very muddled answer. So let's go back to, uh, so we have the fasting on Friday, we have fasting on Saturday. There's evidence 
that indicates that fasting on either of these two days is not permitted. So basically we do have evidence, a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that indicate that fasting on Friday is not permitted or fasting on Saturday is not permitted. And this has led the scholars historically to debate this issue, debate the permissibility or lack thereof of fasting on these two days. And so what I want to start out with, to be clear, because that was one of the places or the, the causes for the confusion, I want to start out with the nusus, the text themselves, the text that give this indication, and they are basically four a hadith. They are basically four prophetic traditions. So the first one or the first set of a hadith are three, and they all were collected by Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, which means that there is no question or, can, or cause for concern regarding their authenticity. They're collected by Imam Bukhari, and his book is unanimously considered the most authentic collection of sayings outside of what? The Quran itself. So the first one is on the authority of Muhammad ibn Abbad. We said, سَأَلْتُ جَابِرًا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ أَنْهُ أَنَهَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَنْ سَوْمِ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَقَالَ نَعَمْ زَادَ غَيْرُ أَبِي عَاصِمْ أَنْ يَنْفَرِدَ بِسَوْمِ So in this hadith, Muhammad ibn Abbad, he said, I asked Jabir ibn Abdullah, the kind of the Prophet he said, I asked him, did the Prophet وسلم, prohibit fasting on Fridays? And Jabir responded, yes. And one of the narrators of the hadith, he said, that it be exclusively fasted. That it be fasted exclusively. As if to what? To explain what Jabir intended. But Jabir didn't say that. He was asked that the Prophet prohibited. He just said what? Yes. Without what? Without giving any details. So I want to pause here. What's the apparent meaning of the hadith? What's the apparent meaning of that hadith? What message do you take from that hadith? That it's prohibited. That it's prohibited and it's prohibited what? Absolutely. Right? Because he didn't, make, he didn't give any tafsir. He said, yeah. Just, no. I'm sorry. He said, yes. The prophet what? Prohibited. Gives the impression that it's absolutely prohibited because he didn't say... It's prohibited but, or it's prohibited under these circumstances, but not under these circumstances, didn't do any of that. And the Rawi comes and he says what, what he meant was that it be what? That it be singled out. Right? That's what the Rawi said. But the second hadith is on the authority of Bihurairah, who said, سَمِعْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ لَا يَسُمَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ يَوْمَ الْجُمْعَةِ so in this hadith, Abu Huraira, he said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, no one should fast, do not let one of you fast on Friday, except coupled with a day before it, or a day after it. So now the hadith of Abu Huraira, it gives us a little bit more clarity than the hadith, the hadith of Jabir. You guys, you guys all agree with that? So the hadith of, Abu, of, of Jabir, it gave us the impression, regardless of the circumstances, you can't what? Can't fast on Friday. Hadith of Abu Huraira says, you can fast on Friday, provided what? Provided? The day before the day after. You, you fast along with it the day before to the day after. Mumtaz. And this hadith of Bihuraira, it supports what the Rawi said in the hadith of Jabir. That what Jabir meant was that it shouldn't be what? Fasted exclusively or singled out for fasting. But it could be fasted with another, with another day. We good so far? Boom test. The third hadith of Bukhari mentioned is the hadith of Abi Ayyubin. And Juwayriya. And if you guys remember last week, I was like, there's a hadith, and that hadith is from one of the Prophet's wives, and it's, I think it's Hafsa. You guys remember that? It wasn't Hafsa, it was who? Juwayriya, right? So Abi Ayyub, he narrates from Juwayriya bint al Harith that the Prophet and the Nabi, dakhla alayha yawm al Jum'ah, 
wahiya sa'ima. The Prophet ﷺ, he came to our house on what day? Friday. Yawm al-Jum'ah. Last week we said what? Saturday. Saturday. Erroneously, right? Just mix the hadith up. And you're going to see why, because we're going to mention one of the hadith that's going to show you where the confusion came in. al So it was Friday. And she was fasting. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Asumti ams. He said, did you fast yesterday? Which would have been what day? Thursday, Mumtaz. Qalat la. She said, no, I didn't fast yesterday. Qalat uridina an tasumi ghadan. He said, do you plan to fast tomorrow? Which is what day? Saturday. Saturday. Mumtaz. Qalat la. Qala fa'athiri. He said, she said, no, I don't intend to fast tomorrow. He said, then, then break your fast. In another version of hadith, it says, فَأَمْرَهَا فَأَفْتَرَتْ The Prophet commanded her and she was. She broke her fast. So a few things here that are apparent from the hadith. First of all, the Prophet came to her on the day of what? Friday. Found her fasting. Asked her, did you fast yesterday? She said, no. Did you fast? Are you planning to fast tomorrow? She said, no. So basically, what was she planning to do? Fast Friday. To fast Friday only. Mumtaz. So the Prophet said, then break your fast. What's the impression that you get? Had she said yes to either one of those, then the Prophet would have said what? No. Continue fasting. That's, that's the impression that what? You get from what? From the hadith. But you also benefit from the hadith that if she had fasted the following day, what day would that have, would that have been? Saturday. And that means that fasting on Saturday, the impression the Prophet is giving you is what? Is jazz. It's permissible. Is it? Doesn't it? Because the Prophet said, are you going to fast tomorrow? And the Prophet is giving the impression that if she had said yes, he would have been fine with her fasting on Friday. But that necessitates that he would also be fine with her fasting when? On Saturday. Right? You guys see that? But it would necessitate that it would be. Hmm? It's okay to fast Saturday by itself. Well, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. But at least, yeah. fasting on Saturday, the impression is what? You can fast on Saturday. Also, bear in mind, the asal, the original rule, the basic rule of thumb, is that fasting on any day is what? Permissible unless we have proof to the contrary. You guys see that? And we're going to see that. Uh, there's an ijma'ah to that effect as well. Let's go now to this other hadith about Saturday now. That hadith was collected by Ahmed wal al Khamsa. Ahmed, Abu Dawood, Al Tirmadhi, and Nasa'i, Ibn Majah, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Busr, al Sulami, from his sister that the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا تسوموا يوم السبت إلا في مفترض عليكم فإن لم يجد فإن لم فإن لم يجد أحدكم إلا لحاء عنب أو عود شجرة فليمضها. This hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, "Do not let." I'm sorry, he, he said, "Do not fast Yom Sept." The Prophet says, "Don't fast Yom Sept." Anytime you have the Prophet saying, "Don't do this" or "Don't do that," what 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 occurs to you initially? It's prohibited. It's forbidden, right? Then he says, "Illa fi alaykum," except. If the fast is an obligatory fast. So don't fast on Fridays unless what? It's obligatory. The only exception is what? An obligatory fast. I'm sorry, Saturday. I'm sorry. Don't fast on Saturday except what? An obligatory fast. The Thumbadadik, then he goes on. When you ekid nahi, he goes on, he what? He emphasizes it. He says, He said, if one of you only finds what? The leaves of grapes or uda shajaratin or twigs from trees then let him do what? let him chew on it to make it clear that he's not what? he's not fasting on what day? Saturday like what impression do you get from that hadith? what do you take from that hadith? what message does it send to you? Huh? <laughs> absolutely right? it's like it's totally prohibited right? Is that the impression you get? Yeah. Because he, first of all, he prohibited, right? He prohibited it. 
Then he made only one exception. It has to be an obligatory fast. Then he went on to say, you should make sure it's so clear that you're not fasting that if you don't find anything to eat except the leaves from grapevines or twigs from trees, then what? Chew on those just to show, make it obvious that you're not fasting. Like the problem with this hadith, in addition to contradicting the hadith of Juwadiyah, that seemed to what? Permit fasting, a voluntary fast on Saturday, is that a great number of the scholars, or the scholars have historically debated the authenticity of this hadith. And a great number of them, particularly the scholars of the early period, have discredited the hadith. And they say that this hadith, la taqumu biha, Al-Hujjah. It's a hadith which cannot be used as one, as a proof for anything. Because of its what? Because of its weakness. Some of them said it's mawdu'ah. It's fabricated. Some of them said um, that it's ma'lul. It is problematic. It has issues in it, etc. And among the scholars who held this opinion are Zuhri. And some of these names will not necessarily mean anything to everyone, but the people I'm mentioning are people who are more than qualified emphatically qualified to make the ruling on this hadith and they, they're from the early period, the period where the people were more astute in their knowledge of crediting and discrediting a hadith. So a Zuhri, an Uzai, Malik, Ahmed, and Nasai, and Hafid ibn Hajar, Ibn al Qayyim, and others. They said the hadith is what? It's weak. They ruled it with having diff- different levels of weakness, but they didn't consider what? An acceptable hadith. There are some scholars who authenticate the hadith, like Abu Dawood himself, at Turmadi, and Hakim, and a highly respected contemporary who will remain nameless. But even those scholars who authenticate it, like Abu Dawood and Turmadi, they don't consider it something who its ruling should be taken at face value. Abu Dawood, he says the hadith is mansukh. It's been abrogated. He said the hadith, it's authentic hadith or sound hadith, but it's been abrogated. It's no longer what? Applicable. It's no longer applied. And at Tirmidhi, he said it's referring to, it's authentic hadith or sound hadith, but it refers to, as Abu Ayyam, Abu Ayyam said, it refers to what? Singling out Saturday. That's what a Tirmidhi said. And only this highly respected contemporary is the only one from the scholars historically. Qadiman wa haditha. From the past and from the present. He's the only one who says that the hadith should be taken at face value and fasting on Saturday is absolutely prohibited except what? In the case of an obligatory fast. Meaning if anybody fasts voluntarily, they should be ordered to what? To break their fast. And if they don't, their fast will not be what? It won't be accepted. He's the only one who says that. And he uses a proof. Are you guys with me up to this point? Is it clear? I don't want to go too fast. I just want to make sure because this is important. And it will be beneficial, especially when we round everything out, I think. So at this point, are we all tracking together? So this highly respected contemporary said, we have to follow this hadith and the literal meaning of this hadith for two reasons. This is number one. This is because there's a qa'idah that says whenever we have different texts which appear to be contradictory uh, and one of them is prohibiting and one of them is allowing, he says the, the one that prohibits is always given precedence of the one that allows. Because the Prophet said, إِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ what he said, uh, he said, he said, if I command you with something, do of it as much as you can. But if I prohibit you from something, then don't do it at all. Right? So he's telling you that what? When I prohibit you, that takes precedence over what? When I command you. All right. He said also, and he said basically this hadith, the statement of the prophet where it prohibits, should be given precedence over any statement he made which seems to what? give permission. The second point that he made is he said that all the hadith that seem for, where, where it seems that the Prophet is giving permission, 
they're all a hadith amaliyah. They're all a hadith where the Prophet is what? Either doing something himself, or his companions are doing something, he's approving of it. These are actions. But he said this, this hadith of Abdullah ibn Busr, this hadith is a statement. The Prophet is what? Prohibiting it. And he said we have to give precedence over the statements of the Prophet. We have to give precedence to his statements over his actions. Those are his two reasons. Right, we respond to that. And again, right now we're starting with Saturday to get that out the way. And we're going to circle back uh, to Friday. So with respect to this issue of fasting on Saturday, the response to what this highly respected contemporary said is number one. That the principles that he mentions, al-hadr muqaddam al mubiyah that a prohibiting text is given precedence over one that permits, and a statement is given precedence over actions, these principles are only applicable in cases where two apparently contradictory texts cannot be reconciled. But here we can reconcile. We can reconcile even if we accept the hadith. We can reconcile between the prohibition in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Busr and the permission in the hadith of Juwaydiya with what? With what? As At-Tirmadhi said, the hadith of Juwaydiya is permitting fasting on Saturday if it's fasted with what? With another day, either Friday or Sunday. You guys see that? So we can combine between them. And since we can reconcile, we don't make what? We don't make a tarjiyah. We don't say one is accepted and one is rejected. Why? Because al-amal bi dalilain awla min ihmal ahadihima. Because acting by all of what we've been commanded to do is always given precedence over acting by one thing and rejecting something else. We try our best to what? To act by all of the nusus, not by one or the other. But number two, whenever we're going to make harmony between the texts, we have to do it in a way that is in accord with the confirmed, established opinions of the scholars, not in a way that introduces an unprecedented view. There is no scholar before this contemporary who said fasting on Saturday is absolutely prohibited. Which leads me to my third point. If we accept that view, it goes against the ichba. The agreement of the scholars regarding what? Regarding fasting on Saturday. Ibn Hazm, he has a book called Marat al Ijma, a book where he combines all of the things that the scholars have agreed on. One of them is a section called uh, Bab al Siyam, or the section of fasting. And under that, he mentions, he says, and I'm going to paraphrase this in, uh, in English from the Arabi. He says, the scholars are agreed. Listen to this, it's important. The scholars are in agreement. That whoever offers a voluntary fast, and he fast a single day. Voluntary fast, one day. And that day that he fasted was not Yom Ashek. It wasn't the day of doubt. What is the day of doubt? The day of doubt is the day that is either the 31st of Shaw, I'm sorry, the 31st of Sha'ban or the 1st of Ramadan. And the people went out looking for the moon. On the 29th, or the, or the, yeah, the end of the day of the 29th, which would be the 30th, I'm sorry, not the 31st, I'm sorry, the 30th of Shabbat. But going into the 30th from the 29th, so we're talking about like Asr time into Maghrib from the 29th, potentially could be the 30th of Shabbat or the 1st of Ramadan. They went out, there was no clouds, they looked for the moon, they didn't see it. It's possible that what? It was there, but they just didn't what? See it. So there's what? Shek. Some people would just do what? They would just fast that day out of an abundance of caution. That's called Siam Yom Shek. Right? So that's one of the days where the scholar said you can't fast that day. All right? He said, or, and the Yom Aladi Ba'da Nis Anis Min Shaban. Or the person who fasted one day after what? The, 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 after the, the halfway point of Shabbat. So he just fasted what? That one day and didn't fast what? Other days. Or Yom Jumu'ah. So he just fasted what? Yom Jumu'ah. Or he fasted one of the days from Ayyam al Tashriq al Thalatha ba'da Yom al Nahar. Or he fasted one of the three days after Eid al Abha. So the 10th of Muharram we make Eid. But that's followed by what? How many days? Three days known as Ayyam al Tashriq. If a person fasted one of those days, the scholars of Islam say, if he fasted any of those days, 
there's difference of opinion about whether or not it would be accepted from him. But if he fasted any other day, any other day besides those days, one day, it would be what? It would be accepted and he would receive a reward. What is Ibn Hazm saying in a roundabout way? The scholars are agree that if you fast Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, by themselves, your fast will be what? Accepted. You guys see that? He's saying by agreement of the scholars. So if we say that you can't fast on Saturday, we're contradicting what? The Ijma. The Ijma of the scholars, right? And as I told you, there's no one who ever said that besides this contemporary. But last but not least, is that this contemporary has no salaf, he has no predecessor, nobody who said what he said historically. And the scholars of Islam have said historically, Iyak and Tkalafi Mesaj and Laysa Lakafiha Imam. Beware of adopting an opinion for which you have no precedent. So that being said, when it comes to Saturday, there is no harm in fasting on Saturday as long as a person doesn't do it, believing that there's some special virtue in fasting on Saturday. And that is because the hadith which prohibits it is apparently weak. Also, we have the hadith of Juwadiyah which indicates permissa, permissibility, right? Because the Prophet said, do you, do you plan to fast tomorrow, which would have been Saturday, indicating she could have fasted on that day. And if she had fasted on that day, her fast on Juma would be accepted. Also, we have to consider other what? Other texts. Like what? Like the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ said the best type of fasting, voluntary fasting, is the fast of David. He used to fast a day and break fast on a day. Like, all right. You say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to start fasting and fast a day. And I'm going to start this Monday. So you fast on Monday. What happens on Tuesday? Tuftir, right? You don't fast. Wednesday? Thursday? Friday? Fast. Saturday? No fast. How can you fast this fast if you can't fast on Juma by itself? You guys see that? Also, how can you fast this fast if you can't fast what? On Saturday. You guys see that? So it's, you have to combine, we have to combine what? The text. Alright? Also, we have to look at what? The Ijma. The agreement of the scholars mentioned by Ibn Hazm, in which he said that there are a handful of days where the scholars differ about whether you can fast them alone. And Saturday's not one of them. You guys see that? Play like Mumtaz. So Saturdays in play, Saturday can be done. There was confusion from last week. We've cleared up half of it with respect to Saturday. Any questions about Saturday? Is that pretty clear to everybody? Ah, it's Father Who is that guy who um, he said he should have <laughs> I don't want to mention his name. I, I purposely didn't mention his name. And one of the reasons why I did that is because when certain names are mentioned, automatically... People are unable to look beyond the name to what was actually said and the evidence to the contrary. So, highly respected contemporary with no precedent. Human being who didn't have a salaf for his opinion. Let's go to Friday now. Fasting Friday exclusively. So the first thing I want to mention about this is that the scholars of Islam have debated this issue as well. This is not a, an, an issue of ijma. If it has a mention that it's one of those days where the scholars have what? Differed and some of them held the opinion that if you fast Friday alone, it won't be accepted and you won't be met jewel. You won't receive a reward for it. But the scholars appear to have four opinions about fasting Jumu'ah exclusively. The first opinion is disallowing it. Disallowing it. Al-mana'ah. And this opinion has been attributed to Ali, Abu Huraira, Salman, Abu Dhar. What's significant about those first four people? What's significant about them? What makes them special? They're, um, they're who? They're not just Salaf. Um, not just Salaf. They're, they're special Salaf. Oh. Ali, Abu Huraira, Salman al Farisi, Abu Dhar al Ghifari. The Ashab Rasulullah, right? So right then and there, 
That strengthens what? This opinion because it's the opinion of what? Ashab Rasulullah. Right? It's also the opinion of Imam Ahmad, Ibn Mundir, some of the Shafi'iyyah, and it's apparently the opinion of a Bukhari. Why? Because when he mentioned those three at Hadith, he titled the chapter, the title of the chapter in which he cited those Hadith, he said, Babu Sawmi Yawm Al-Jum'ah, Wayda Asbaha Sa'im and Yawm Al-Jum'ah, Fa'alayhi and Yuftir. He said the chapter regarding fasting on Friday, and if a person awoke fasting on the day of Friday, then he must break his fast. So Al-Bukhari, not only is he of the opinion that a person can't fast on Friday, he's of the opinion that what? You have to break your fast. You can't fast. It's not legal to fast on Friday. Now this opinion, disallowing it, it appears to be a 1A and 1B type of situation. So 1A are the people who consider fasting impermissible and require the fasting person to break their fast. They consider it's not acceptable. It's like fasting on Eid. You guys see that? If a person came to the Eid prayer, and after Eid, we're having breakfast, and somebody said, okay, you're not eating, come on, have some breakfast. And said, no, no, I'm in the Sa'im. I said, no, no, I'm fasting today. Well, what were we saying? Can't fast. What if he said, I'm going to fast, I'm going to fast, I must fast. It won't be accepted. It will not be accepted. Right? Because the Prophet Naha and Sawmi Yomi, the Prophet prohibited the fasting on two days. Yom al-Fitri wa Yom al-Abha. He prohibited the fasting on two days, the fasting on the day of Fitr and the day of the sacrifice. So those two days you cannot fast absolutely be ijma' al muslimin by agreement of the scholars of Islam. And the two scholars who hold this opinion, you can't fast on Friday, just like you can't fast on Eid, Ibn Mundur and Al-Bukhari, apparently, because of the mention, as we mentioned, the way that he titled the chapter. So 1b, what does 1b say? 1b says that it's not haram on the same level of the two Eids. It's not on the same plane. It's If somebody fasted on that day, it would be accepted, but at the same time, if they didn't have a legitimate reason, we're going to talk about that shortly, they would be opposing what? The guidance of the Prophet. And they would be like those people, if you guys remember the famous hadith where the Prophet wasallam he went out and he was traveling on a day that was very hot uh, in Ramadan. And his companions were with him. And because the Prophet Asbaha Sa'iman, because the Prophet started that day fasting and was in that journey fasting, they also fasted. But many of them, fasting for them became very difficult. And a person from amongst their companions who came to the Prophet and said, yeah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, qad shaqq ala nasi as-sawm. He said, indeed, fasting has become difficult for the people. Some of the people are struggling. It's difficult for them to fast, given the heat. And given the fact that we're traveling, some people on foot, etc. So the Prophet ﷺ, he worked his way to the head of the caravan, stopped his camel, and stood there and he drank from his water skin in front of what? In front of everybody. To show the people he was what? He wasn't fasting anymore. And many of the people followed suit and broke their fast. So then the Prophet was informed that some of the people continued to work, continued to fast. Prophet said, Ula'ikum, I'm sorry, Ula'ika al usa He said, those people are what? They're the, they're the insubordinate ones. They're the ones who are being disobedient. But he didn't say their fast was what? Invalid. You guys see that? So it appears that 1B is saying that it's like this. That that fasting on Friday is like this. And there's some exceptions. There's some exceptional cases where it wouldn't even be what? It wouldn't even be necessarily prohibited. Like, for example, a person who's fasting the fast of what? Dawood. And we gave the example, start on Monday, fast on Monday. Skip Tuesday. Fast on Wednesday. Skip Thursday. Fast on what? Friday. Skip what? So what did you just do? Fasted Friday by itself. You guys see that? The second thing is that there may be a fast obligatory fast, and a person can only fast on that day. So, for example, let's say you have days to make up for Ramadan, and you're in a situation where the only opportunity, the only window opportunity for you, given your circumstances, your work, or whatever, is what? Is on Friday. 
So that person certainly could what? Make qaba on Friday. And we have to accept this explanation of the this opinion because we have to explain the opinion of the scholars as best we can in a way that what? Does not oppose the other one, the other texts. And we mentioned some of those texts. So it appears that the opinion of the companions that we talked about, Ali and Abu Huraira and Salman and Abu Dhar, it would be that opinion, 1B. The opinion that it's prohibited, but not something that you will not be what? Ma'jur alay. And there are exceptions to the rule. And when those exceptions are in play, the person is what? The person is, is allowed to fast. The second opinion is that the prohibition of fasting on Friday is one of a tanzi, la la tahrim. It's one of disapproval and discouragement, and not absolute prohibition. Meaning, sometimes when the Prophet prohibits something, he's discouraging us and not absolutely what prohibiting it. He's not absolutely forbidding it, but he says it in a very emphatic way to let you know that this is not like a normal prohibition. It's something what that really you should what, try to avoid at all at all costs. But if you must, you must. And this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. And Jumhur, most of the scholars of Islam, take this what? This second opinion. Opinion number three. La yukra. It's not even disliked. It's okay to fast on Friday. There's no big deal. And this, this opinion was attributed to Malik and Abu Hanifa by Ibn Hajr in Al-Fatih. So according to Malik and Abu Hanifa, according to Ibn Hajr, it's what? It's permissible to fast. And it's not even disliked to fast on Friday. But number four. It's not prohibited. Except for the one who fasting inhibits him from performing other religious duties and encouraged acts associated with Friday. The whole reason why the Prophet said don't fast on Friday is because there's so many virtuous deeds that he wants us to do on Friday. And a person may be so weakened by fasting that he what? He opts to what? To just not perform those, those deeds, right? Because he just doesn't have the strength to perform those deeds. And this is one of the two, uh, uh, famous opinions held by Shafi'iyya, the other one being the opinion of what? Al-Jamhur, number two. So help me, uh, help me suss it out. You want to ask something first? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, is this, the, all these four uh, scenarios, are they, are they for fasting Friday alone? Yeah. Fast Friday alone. Because generally speaking, generally speaking, and there are some exceptions. Generally speaking, there's not too much difference in opinion about fasting Friday with another day. And the reason reason for that is a hadith that we're going to see shortly. But I want to ask you guys, you heard the, the opinions. 1A, 1B, 2, 3, and 4. What do you think? What was 1 again? 1A is disallowed. 1B is disallowed. Except... In certain exceptional cases, and if a person fasted, the fast would be accepted, but he would be disobeying the Prophet. Huh? So two, just two. You go with number two. Anybody else have a different view, or we all want to go with two? We'll so vote on it. The, the second and the, the, second and the <laughs> third one sound... Two and three, you said. Yeah. So three, you just say, la you cry. It's not even disliked. To fast Friday by itself. Okay. Al Jumhur. Like we just go with the majority. Alhamdulillah. Huh? Like, okay, a lot of people are inclined toward two, and two is strong. There's no question about it. But I want you to think about something. If we go with two, then we're not following the companions. Stay away from the Rasul. Min ba'di ma tabaynahu al huda. Wa yattabi ghayra sabi al mu'mineen. Min wallihi ma tawalla. Wa nuslihi jahannam. Wa sa'at basira. Right? Said. And whoever contradicts and opposes the messenger and follows the path other than the path of believers. Who are the believers, first and foremost? The companions. We will leave him to the path he has chosen. And we will burn him in hell and an evil destination. He says, he says, and those first and foremost to accept Islam from the muhajireen, the immigrants and the ansar, which is what? Ashab Rasulullah, right? And those who follow them in righteousness, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. 
if we follow the companions. He also said, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِحْتَدُوا Right? If you believe as they believe, meaning the companions, then you'll be what? You'll be guided. So I want you to think about that. Because there's no question, this is what for me, when I'm studying all this, gives me pause. The, the statement of the Jumhur or the appeal of the Jumhur, Jumhur yeah, you're like, yeah, it, it, it makes sense from a number of angles. But the one problem with it is it's not the opinion of what? The companions, right? And we, we, we don't want to be in one valley and the companions are in another valley. So, if it, so, let's say this. Let's go back through them one more time. 1A is most consistent with the literal wording of the hadith, right? Isn't it? 1A, that says what? It's prohibited. You guys agree with that? It's most consistent with the literal little wording. But it's problematic because it disallows, for example, Son Dawood, doesn't it? It makes so, the fast of David not permitted. You start on a Tuesday. Start on a Tuesday, and but at some point you're not gonna you have to break that cycle to get back on a Tuesday again. You see what I'm saying? Because think about it. If the first week I start on Tuesday, I'm off on Thursday. I'm sorry, off on Wednesday. Come back on Thursday, then I'm off on Friday. Back on what? Saturday. Saturday. Off on what? Sunday. Back on what? Monday. And I end up what? The next week I end up on Friday. Hey, so Dawood's fast was the best, but so it's as, as if the prophet is encouraged us to do it, and at the same time, if we take the little wording of the other hadith, it's like he's what he's telling us what you can't do it. So that's that's what makes the first opinion problematic. One A, like one B, is strong, very strong. Why? For I'll give you the reasons. Number one, it takes into account the other texts, including the hadith collected by Muslim which says, listen to this one. لا تخص الليلة I'm sorry لا تخص ليلة الجمعة بقيام من ليالي ولا تخص يوم الجمعة بصيام من بين الأيام إلا أن يكون في سوم يسومه أحدكم عجا. So in this hadith, the Prophet said, "Do not set aside or single out the night before Friday for قيام الليل for praying at night, and do not single out Friday for fasting." Except one of you who had a day of fasting that he used to what? Fast habitually. So this is the prophet is saying what? If there's a fast, you normally what? Fast, you can do what? You can fast on Friday. Even if it means singling out what? Friday. Let's say, for example, person says every first day of the month, I fast. I like to begin every month with fasting. And the first day of the month occurs on Friday. So every, every last day of the month, I like to what? Fast, I like to close my month with fasting. And that occurs on what? A Friday. Also, what about Ashura? What if Ashura comes on what? A Friday. What if Yom Arafah comes on a Friday? Right? And we already talked about what? Siam? Dawood. So the 1B, it takes what? That into consideration and what? Allows for that circumstance. You guys see that? 1B. Number two, 1B also, it differentiates between the prohibition of fasting on the two Eids and, the, and that of fasting on Jumu'ah. Are they the same or are they different? We know the Prophet ﷺ prohibited fasting on what? On the two Eids. He also prohibited fasting on what? Al Jumu'ah. But are they, the same, are they on the same plane? No. Because I'm going to ask you, if you fasted on Eid and you fasted the day before Eid and the day or, or the day after Eid, would that make it legal? But if you fast on Jumu'ah and you fast the day before, day after, would that make it legal? Yes. So they're not the what? They're not the same. We can't make them the same because the Prophet distinguished between the two. You guys see that? So when we take opinion 1B, we're making what? We're making the distinction. You guys see that? Slide number three, that opinion 1B, it also takes into consideration those highly recommended voluntary fasts, which are a single day and they could land... On al Jumu'ah, we talked about that. Som Dawood, we talked about Arafah, Ashura, etc. Number three, I'm sorry, number four, opinion 1b takes into consideration or it allows for making up the misfasts and the fast of oaths. Like we talked about, a person has Qaba from Ramadan. 1b would let us what? Fast on that day. 1a 
would not let us fast on that day. You guys see that? And last but not least, it's the opinion of what? The companions. And so that's what makes one uh, one be particularly what? Strong. Opinion two is very strong. It's just lacking. And it, and it has all of these in it. It has one through four. But it's lacking what? Number five, being the opinion of the companions. So that being said, what do you say now? And I'm not pushing you guys in any direction. Because if somebody said I'd take the opinion of Jumu, I'm going to respect it. I just wanted you to think about the fact that if you, if you, if we can follow the companions, and we just, and it's not just not any normal companions. One of them is a, a Khalifa Rashid. Is one of the rightly guided caliphs, and the Prophet said, "Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al Khulafa Rashid al Mahdi min baadi." Follow my sunnah and sunnah of rightly guided caliphs after me. So, what do you guys say? One A, one B, two, three, or four? You still two. Just forget about what the companion said. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> what do you say, uh, Hussam? Two was Jumhur. Oh, no. Two, we're talking about you have one A, one B. One B, we're talking about. One B is yeah. the one, the companions, yeah. I think we just have one B. Huh? One B. One B. Huh? One A, it's just totally prohibited. No Son Dawood, no Ashura, no Arafah, mashallah. <laughs> what do you think, uh, Abu Khadija? I think we try to avoid as much as we can, uh -huh. but if we have to, we fast. Eh. But uh, at the same time, we, we don't want to sing loud. Yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't. So, is that 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4? Two. Two. 2, you like Jumhur? Yeah. MashaAllah. Abu Ayham, you, you're still Jumhur. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? I'm, I'm just, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so we, we put it out there, though. We put it out there. Nobody has to say what they feel. Maybe you have to process it. I just, I, I'm just i just going to tell you what I feel. I feel strongly about 1B. I feel strongly, and the reason why is because of the companion. And I think it's very close. It's very close to what? It's very close to uh, 2. With the exception, like as I said, it, the companion say what? Al-Asl, Al-Manat. And what? The original, original rule is what? You don't do it, but there are some what they they make they allow for those exceptions, right? The problem with that is is that we never want to uh قولاً جديداً or make a تلفيق. Well, basically, we take one pole, another pole, and we do what? We marry them together and create what? Now, a new position. We always want to have a salaf. So the problem with that, and a lot of scholars do that. They want to what? They, they, they want to take this opinion, which is strong from Minjiha. This one's strong from Minjiha. They do what? They make a tanfiq. We can't do that because what we're technically doing in that case is what? Coming with what? A new opinion. And we, so we don't want to do that. So basically, for that reason, that's why, that's the only reason why I would say, no, no, I, I can't, uh, I can't go with that because, but the opinion of the companions allows for that. It allows for that. So we don't even really need that. It allows for Ashura, allows for Arafah, but without what necessarily having to what? Fast a day before or fast a day after. All right. So with that said, I want to close out with a couple of things, a couple of points uh, that I thought were really important to mention uh, related to this uh, experience that we had. The first thing I wanted to say, um, because this all came about because of the mistake that I made, are that mistakes are reality. And what we learn today, I hope, is that mistakes can be a good thing, provided that we grow from them. It's okay to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. every human being makes mistakes. But they're only good if we grow from them. As the Prophet said, وَخِيلُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوْ He said, the best of those who make mistakes are those who what? Who make amends. They learn from their mistakes and they what? They grow from them. And so what did this mistake do for us? It was a deeper, deeper class on yeah, Preach. clarity. Preach. It, 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 it led to a, a, an increased understanding of these two issues, right? Which were end up, end up being what? Conflated. So I'm going to ask you honestly. 
Do you leave this class today having a better understanding, a better grasp of the ruling on fasting on Saturday and the ruling on fasting on Friday? If you got into a situation where you were in a discussion with somebody, you were fasting on Saturday, and say, you can't fast on Saturday, would you be able to articulate the reason why it's okay? You'd be able to do that. Now, I'm going to ask you honestly, if that happened last Saturday, would you be able to articulate on the same level without this discussion? So we, we grew, we, 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 we benefited, and so mistakes can be what? They can be a good thing as long as we what? We learn from them. The number two from the points is that adin nasiha, religion is being sincere and advising sincerely. And I personally came to realize that I had erred because of the advice of two people. So basically what happened to me was, I told you I had that, that weird feeling. Something was not right. As I'm talking, it's like the iron is on. No, I'm, t- I'm certain I unplugged it. The stove is on. No, I remember turning it off. That had that in there. And it just wouldn't go away even when I got home. And then uh, somebody reached out to me that evening. They were watching. And they said, hey, I think you should revisit this. And then somebody, a few days later, they did something similar. And so, alhamdulillah, uh, because of that advice, what? I corrected what? My error. So the religion is... Sincerity and sincere advice. Like number three, how should we advise? Tells you that there's benefit in advising, right? The prophet just wasn't telling us something. There's benefit in advising, but the question is how should we advise? What's the right versus the wrong way? So this person, the first person who um, who gave me advice, if you will, is very impressed with his uslub, with his method or his approach. He sends me a uh, Two pages from Sahih Bukhari. After that, he follows up with what? With a voice message. And he starts out and he says, hey, I was watching you tonight. Very good lecture. Very beneficial. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but I think that uh, there might have been some confusion when it came to the issue of X, Y, and Z. And there's some hadith in Bukhari I think you should look at. And... Uh, and then maybe clarify to the people after that. But I'm going to ask you a question. What's the benefit of saying, I was watching, I thought the lecture was really good, took some benefit from it, but keda wa keda wa keda. What's the benefit of starting out like that? Now you can lay into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one way to look at it. That's one way to look at it. No, he put the credit due. Uh, well, if that's a good, that's probably not. But, I, yeah, you know, he, he, thank him and, you know. Hey. All right, let me ask you a question. Typically, when somebody says, hey, I want to tell you something, naturally, within yourself, even if you don't do it without yourself, what do you do? I huh? sent. <laughs> you become defensive. I sent, I sent, I sent. Your guard goes up. Like, how, do you dis- how do you make a person lower their guard? Man, just like that. Wow. I mean, immediately what? Your guard goes down. This person is not coming to attack me. This person is not something I should be afraid of. This person is not going to harm me in any way. Right? There's no need for me to be what? To be defensive. Right? So you put your guard down. And then what? He's able to what? Give them, give them the seat. You did a good job. Huh? Yeah, I mean, something like that. I mean, you know, something like that. Right? Al-Muhim, it's a very good asloop. And that's really the to be honest with you, that's the right way to approach it. And we don't, we don't do that enough. And that's really, to be honest with you, that's the right way to approach it. And we don't do that enough. What's the wrong way? The wrong way is, for example, when a person just lays into you. You're wrong, and you need to correct yourself. And I've seen that. Right? You're wrong, and you need to correct yourself. So, for example, you quote a hadith. And there's different opinions from the scholars about whether or not the hadith is authentic or not. person watched the lecture, and they didn't hear nothing in the lecture except what? That hadith that they considered to be what? Weak. That hadith is a weak hadith, and you need to... Correct yourself and go back and tell the people that the hadith is weak. That, that was who. Or a person, for example, they send you a link. No salam. No greeting. No discarding. This is what? In your face, right? In your face, right? Or they meet you, right? As you're coming out the door with what some papers they printed out, right? Right? 
Look, look at all these look at all these fatawa that go against what you said. Right. Or you get out to your car and in your in your door gym, right in your. Uh, <laughs> you say the end of the wiper, right? There's what a paper that says what, you know, you know, that thing that you said was wrong, whatever. That's just not the way you do it. That's not the way you do it. Right. But. Why do we do it the wrong way sometimes? Why do we shove the papers in somebody's face? Why do we send the link, huh? We're passionate, which is true. A lot of times we're passionate. But I think a lot of times, too, we assume that the person's not going to what? Listen. Yeah, they're not going to accept. We assume they're not going to accept. We assume, we assume that the exchange is not going to be pleasant anyway. So we start with what? We start off unpleasant. It's not going to be pleasant anyway. We're not going to accept. So what? Let me just give it to them. Let me give it to them raw, as they say, right? Yeah. And the sad thing is that there's two things. One, the first thing is that sometimes we create the idea, we give people the impression that we're not going to work, except the nasiha. And also by giving the nasiha in this way, we make, we, we make it difficult for the person to what? Accept, because we're all what? We're all human. We all want to what? Maintain our dignity. We all have a certain level of pride. May Allah protect us all from being proud. You know, proud. You know what I'm saying? You know, disrespect me. You know, that's what happens. That's, so we have to understand how we're setting ourselves up for failure by what? By going about the wrong way. The last point I want to make is regardless of how the nasiha comes. Regardless of how it comes. And this is very important, yeah, Juan. If you guys and sisters, if you guys don't take anything from today, take this. Regardless of how the advice comes. If it's true, we should do what? We should accept it. The problem with us, and this is a big problem with the Muslims in general, is that we concern ourselves too much with the appearance of the gift. We concern ourselves too much with the deliverer of the gift. Or the delivery of the gift. And we don't pay attention to the gift itself. I'm going to ask you honestly. Somebody gives you a very nice gift on Eid. And they wrap it up really nice. I'm going to ask you honestly. Do you open the box and say, oh, this is exactly what I wanted. Take the thing out, put it on the nightstand, and then take the box and sit and, and start playing with the box? Yes. <laughs> do you do that? Really, A.M., you do that. <laughs> Most people don't do that, A.M., all right? Most people don't do that. They, f they focus on what? The gift, not the box that came in. Right? They don't focus on the person who delivered it. The FedEx man comes. Bing bong. You know what I mean? And he hands him a gift. And they don't throw the gift down and say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> man, it's been a while since you came. We don't do that. But when it comes to a nasiha, we do. I'm not going to accept a nasiha, nasiha. Why? Because you delivered it. Not going to accept it because what? The box it came in. We have to stop doing that. Accept the Nasiha regardless of what? Regardless of the packaging, regardless of the delivery, regardless of if it's the truth. We accept it. Somebody sent me, one of the people who, 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 who advised me just sent me what? Sent me a link. I'll be honest, I didn't like that. But I knew it was about why, because the other person had already, you know, pulled my coat. So I've read the, and I'm, I'm not big on the, where the link came from. I, I'm not big on that person who, the person who put the thing together. I read it. Saw where they were coming from. Certainly had some truth in what they were saying. There were also some holes in what they said. I said, but yeah, this has got to be clarified. And the record's got to be set straight. I was wrong, and I don't have a problem saying to the people on Facebook. I don't have a problem saying to you. I don't have a problem saying to the people in Clubhouse. I'm going to accept the what? The Nasiha, regardless of how it came. Because I can't tell you something and what? And do something else. Y'all see that? And our deen is built upon this. It's built upon this. And we know this because the Prophet of Islam, I'm going to close with this. One night, toward the end of Ramadan, he appointed Abu Huraira to what? To guard Zakat al And he was guarding it and he heard some people, what? some person rummaging through what? Through the, through the, the, the food stuff. So he caught a hold of them. 
And he said, I'm going to take you to the Messenger of Allah. I'm going to report you. You're under arrest, and I'm going to turn you in. And the man said, oh, I, I have such a large family, and I'm so hungry, and I was just trying to get some food for them. Please don't turn me in. I won't come back again. So out of compassion, he let him go. Next night, same thing. And every time he came in the morning, the prophet met him on the way to the masjid and said, what happened to your companion last night? The prophet already knew what, what had happened via revelation. So this happened two nights in a row. And on the third night, Abu Huraira said, no, this time I'm definitely going to turn you in. All right. Because the prophet said you were going to come back and you came back and I'm turning you in. So the man said, please let me go and I will teach you something that will benefit you. I will teach you something that if you say it, uh, an angel will guard you throughout the night until you're awake. So Abu Huraira said, okay, teach him. And he taught him to say ayat al kursi. So Abu Huraira let him go. He said, when you go to sleep, put your cup, your cheek, I'm sorry, cup, yeah, cup your, 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 your cheek in your hand, in your right hand, lay on your right side, and recite al kursi. So he met the Prophet in the morning, the Prophet said, what happened to your side? What happened to your companion last night? And Abu Huraira told him the story, he said he was going to teach me something, blah, 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 blah. And the Prophet said, sadaqaka wa huwa kadhub. He said, he told you the truth, but he's what? He's a liar. Do you know who you've been talking to for the last three nights? A shaitan. He said, that was the devil. But he didn't tell Abu Huraira not to what? Not to take the nasiha. Right? Even though it came from who? Shaitan himself. I'll see that. Got to take the advice. No matter how it comes, no matter who it comes from, you got to take the advice. And this could come from your spouse. Sometimes your wife will tell you something as a man. And you're saying, man, I'm going to listen to a woman. She's right, man. Ah, darn, I hate when she's right. <laughs> and we don't want to listen, but we have to listen. If they're right, they're right. Because it's not about who said it. It's about what was said and whether or not it's the truth. Adhu wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. And with Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa barakatuh.